And then finally, case uh, 28 uh, is an important disease that I don't think I've covered before. So I wanted to take the time to go over it and I didn't want to make the poor derm residents late to clinic. So here we have a big shave biopsy and you can tell that this is thickened acanthotic epidermis with elongated reedy and it's got a lot of serum scale crust with inflammation on the surface. Look at all of this, parakeratosis, fibrin and serum and neutrophil debris just from low power. Surely we're going to find some bacterial and patogenization when we go closer. So this appearance microscopically corresponds to what this looks like clinically, which would be wet, kind of weeping, eroded and ulcerated, or sometimes people use the word macerated plaques in the anogenital area and often too in the axilla, sometimes also around the folds of skin on the neck in some patients. And usually the patient will have this and also will have other family members with this. So that's an important clinical um, scenario. And then here's the microscopic feature that we see. In addition to the abundant scale crust and serum, we can already tell that the epidermis is falling apart. And it's it could look like spongiosis at first glance, but in other areas we can see that there's actual detached keratinocytes that have rounded edges. And so when I see that, that's acantholysis, okay? So it's important, though, I think, to keep in mind that acanthalysis and spongiosis can have overlapping morphology microscopically sometimes. If you just had this, you could certainly just think of spongy, like right here, spongiotic dermatitis. But once I start seeing single cells coming loose and rounding up and floating in the space, and you can't really tell on this scan because it's not a great H&E, it's a little bit faded, <clears throat> but also um, in, in a... A more nicely stained specimen, the keratinocyte cytoplasm gets more dense and more pink usually. As the cell rounds up, the, the keratin filaments get more get thicker, they're not as stretched out, and it makes the cytoplasm look denser and more pink. Like you can kind of appreciate in these cells here is what's starting to happen. So those are all clues. If I see that, I think of acantholysis. And that's important because a handful of diseases have acantholysis. Acantholytic Acanthalysis plus dyskeratosis, we can think of, uh, uh, we can think of, uh, warty uh, dyskeratoma, like we talked about earlier, Grover's disease, um, Derrier's disease, and others. But when we just have acanthalysis, usually without the rounded dyskeratosis, we can think of Haley-Haley disease, which is what this is, also known as benign familial pemphigus or benign chronic pemphigus. It looks a lot like Pemphigus vulgaris, except it is not actually immune mediated. It is due to a genetic, an inherited genetic defect in an ATPase, uh, which is, a, I believe, a calcium channel transporter in the endoplasmic reticulum of cells. And um, the particular one involved here is ATP2C1. And I think, in the, if I recall, in Derrier's disease, it's ATP. Uh, ATPA is 2A2, but here in Haley Haley, ATPA is 2A, or 2C1. And uh, the way the dermatology residents I've trained have taught me to remember this is they always have the best mnemonics, it seems, for memorizing obscure points. They said, I want to see Haley's Comet one day. And so Haley Haley disease, ATPA is 2C1. There you go. If it works for you, keep it. And the pattern of acantholytic keratinocytes, how they're kind of connected and rounded up, has been uh, likened to a dilapidated brick wall or a very old brick wall in which the corners of the brick have eroded away over the many, many years and rounded up. And I was, uh, I was in Italy, <clears throat> in Rome last year, and I was near the Colosseum and found a brick wall that I don't know if it was how old it was, but it was very old, as is everything in Italy, I think. And so I took pictures of it. I'll have to post those because I was like, ooh, I'm going to use this for teaching Haley Haley disease, a, a bona fide Roman dilapidated brick wall. I don't know if it was actually from the Roman era or later times, but in any case, uh, it did look a little bit like this if you have a very good imagination. But I think it's also important when you see this to keep in mind actual autoimmune pemphigus. And um, if there's any doubt about that, direct immunofluorescence will sort that out. And also there are times where you can see this pattern of acantholysis in the genital area, but instead of big plaques or a family history, it will be multiple small papules. And that's called, I believe that's called uh, acantholytic dermatosis of the genitocural area because it involves the, uh, the genital area or the thighs. 
um, the inner thighs, and it can microscopically mimic Haley Haley, but clinically does not have the same uh, uh, presentation or or um, I don't believe there's a familial link to it that I know of, but I've only seen that a couple times, so uh, there may be things I don't know about that disease, but that's another thing to keep in mind in this differential, all right? And uh, sometimes Grover's disease can, can lack dyskeratosis and just have a pattern kind of dilapidated brick wall-like. So if you see this pattern, but it's itchy bumps on the trunk of an older adult, that it's probably actually Grover's disease, not Haley Haley. So the pattern plus the clinical really matters in these acantholytic and dyskeratotic diseases. All right, but this is a really good example of Haley Haley disease. And I actually did see this once in clinic when I was a fellow and the patient was very nice and had had this disease their whole life and other family members did. And, and uh, that patient mentioned to me that he had been actually diagnosed by one of the Haley brothers who I believe were both dermatologists who are brothers who uh, first described uh, this syndrome. And he was one of the patients that they had seen in their clinic. Um, uh, and they, of course, had many patients with this disease. So I thought that was a really cool um, historical link, and I was thankful for that patient sharing that story uh, with me. And um, that's where Haley and Haley, it's Haley-Haley. It's because it were two brothers, both with the last name of Haley. So there you go. Try that out at your next cocktail party and see if your friends think it's a cool uh, point of medical history. Well, if you've stuck around this long, I hope you enjoyed the session. And uh, thanks very much for watching. Have a great day. And please uh, consider liking and subscribing to my channel if you're on YouTube or follow me on Kiko if you're viewing me there. Thanks a bunch.